this is the last, the fifth of the uh, series about the Xeris Tachvatad, about the Kazakh uh, uh, uprising and the Jews. And uh, I've done as much as time will permit in terms of the actual facts. Now let's look at the aftermath. That's what I uh, promised to do. Uh, I have a very intelligent audience this particular round of lectures. I'm serious because I got a lot of very good questions, either person or in emails, uh, which were very pertinent historically uh, to what we've been talking about and not uh, some of the usual blather. So somebody asked me last week, and it's perfectly fair, you know, what's going on in general at this time to give her and some other people an idea of the general trend in Europe. Now, I'm going to take a minute to do that or so uh, because it will be of a certain amount of interest in the sense of situating the events that we're talking about in their proper context, but I don't want to overdo that. So everything we spoke about, I direct your attention to the map over here in 1648. The, uh, this is what Europe looked like, roughly speaking, at that time. As you can see, there aren't that many countries, but there are you know, some big, big ones. Uh, Poland was big at that time. Russia, as you see, was big. Ottoman Empire was big. And even some of your European states are kind of large. And then you have all these little hundreds of states, which are called Germany or the Holy Roman Empire at that time. Now, I don't want to take you on a tour of the geography of Europe in 1648. I just want to make the following point. If you ask me what's going on during 1648 in Europe, I'll give a very general answer. And that is that you divide European history up up to 1815 and after. And by that I mean, up to 1815, there were constant wars all the time all over the place. You can't keep track of them. If I even told you to you now, that'd be weird that I can memorize this stuff. There are hundreds of conflicts going on uh, forever in Europe. Uh, you really want to go down the line, notice how many wars was England involved in the 1600s? Well, yeah, the, the Civil War in the 1640s, before that they had some Irish uh, campaigns, then, uh, you know, they wanted to get involved in the Thirty Years' War, and that didn't work out exactly, but the King James had to fight the Scots. You see what I'm saying? It gets crazy. Then you have the Oliver Cromwell Wars, and then afterwards you get England involved. Every few years there's another war. And England was relatively uninvolved. Talk about France. Talk about the Germans or the Austrians or whoever. It, it, it becomes crazy. That was typical. Until before 1815, uh, war was uh, a one continuous thing interrupted by peace. Ever since 18, for the last 200 years, it's the opposite. Europe switched to being at peace. Now, there are two gigantic exceptions. I understand that. World War I and World War II. I'm the, we're, we're the last people to you know, underplay and underestimate the importance of that. But they are. Uh, think about what I'm saying. Since 1815 until uh, today, uh, England, France, Germany, these places have been at war uh, basically once, or uh, uh, excuse me, twice. And if you're France and Germany, three times. Uh, that's very little. Uh, the Europeans eventually got it. There are a couple of small wars that pop up from time to time in Europe, but only a, a couple. As we sit here today or stand, there's a couple of uh, military uh, wars going on in the place in the Balkans and places that many of us don't even know where they are, in Kosovo and who knows where, you know, Bosnia and places like that. Uh, I always like to ask this, who can tell me the capital of Macedonia? You know, it's not the old map that you and I knew when we were kids. The point is that uh, Europe changed. But at the time we were speaking about in the Xeris Tachwetat, uh, think of how many wars Poland got into in the small period of time that I'm talking to you. Well, it's the wars against the the Ukrainians and against the Tatars and then the Ottoman Turks get into it and then Russia gets into it as I described last time and then Sweden and then Prussia it, it goes crazy and uh, that was life and so uh, that's how you made money uh, that's what you needed to know about if you're in business where does a war go on at this particular time or elsewhere somewhere in Europe there's always a war going on uh, Jews had to know how to maneuver in between that kind of reality uh, Jews generally were not soldiers but uh, they lived in lands in which they are going to be traversed by soldiers. As they gate us, it's not the USA that you and I know and love today in which we never see soldiers. It's a country that's been at peace. But Baltimore hasn't been invaded, as far as I can recall, since uh, the War of 1812, when right? Star Spangled Banner. Uh, that's interesting. This is not the reality that these people were used to at that time. The communities that lived in the Ukraine or in other parts of Poland, knew there were always wars going on somewhere. 
The only thing is they don't want it to happen to them. And generally speaking, as I tried to indicate, Poland in the good old days, from our point of view, which is from the time the Jews came there in the 1500s, let's say, and the early 1600s, was powerful enough once upon a time that all the battles that the Poles fought were in the borders, in the frontier areas, you know what I'm saying? Over here and up there and these kind of places against the Swedes and the, you know, the Turks. And so if you lived like most Jews did in Krakow or Lublin or Lemberg or Posen or Vilna, they were very far away from the battle lines. It was, that's, that's what you call in Europe a, a zone of peace. Right? If the war isn't you know, within 20 miles of your house or 30 miles of your house, you live in a peaceful zone. So it's just, I, I mention that, to, you know, to give you some kind of a, 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 a grounding or, or a context. 1648 was the end of the Thirty Years' War, when over here, these are the German states, they all shechted each other. A wiped out B, and then B wiped out A. The Catholics did it to the Protestants, the Protestants did the Catholics so successfully that when the Thirty Years' War was over, the Catholic Church had to give a header that you can do bigamy because of underpopulation. Okay? Uh, that's when Germany came close to wiping itself out, which is an interesting prospect. The, uh, there were constant other wars uh, in 1649 is when Oliver Cromwell chopped off the head of King Charles I. So things were going on everywhere. But we're going to focus here, obviously, on the experience of the largest and most important Jewish community anywhere, which I repeat outnumbered. I think even at that time, and certainly a little bit later, outnumbered all the other Jews in the world put together. And so what happens in the Zeros Tachvatat is not simply of significance for a Jewish community, which it is, but, uh, and not only for us, because most of us are probably descendants from those people, which we are, but uh, because it affected the largest community anywhere. Now, uh, I can just tell you that from the internal Jewish point of view, the, it not only was a shock, the 1648 was supposed to be when the Mashiach comes. Because uh, the 1600s was a big era of Kabbalah. And one of the aspects of Kabbalah, not the only one, is you're very into calculating when Mashiach is coming and things like this. And Zos, the year Tav Ches, is uh, 1648, is also equal to Tav Zion Aleph. Isn't that right? Zos. Bezos Yovo Aaron El HaKodesh. You can already start to hear the drushes that were preached once upon a time. When will we come to the Kodesh HaKadoshim? When will, meaning, when's the Mashiach coming? And uh, indeed, you find in the writings of uh, people who lived at that time, wrote about like the Shach and others, we'll talk about, uh, that they said, wait a minute, this is the opposite of what it was supposed to be. It was supposed to be the time of the good, of the Mashiach. And you may be certain that many people in Jews at that time, obviously if you lived in Eastern Europe, this is clearly the apocalyptic pre-Messianic wars. World War III that you learn about in, in places like the Book of Daniel, that the Ikfis and Mashiach, the Chevle Leido, the uh, coming of Mashiach is accompanied by the har most horrible catastrophes. Read the book of, uh, of Daniel, and we saw that it really happens, that they were convinced, but of course they were wrong. So the year 1640, was a very important year in the Jewish reckoning, but of course it didn't turn out the way it was. In terms of, uh, someone asked me what was going on in the Jewish culture at that time. This is the period of uh, all the people in the Shulchan Aruch. The Shach, the Bach, the Taz, the uh, Tosus Yontif, all the big rabbis you heard about once upon a time. Because as I said before, the civilization of the Jews in Poland had been developing more and more richly uh, for close to 150 years. Actually, for 150 years at that time. What I talked about a couple of sessions ago, just keep it going generation after generation, so all through the 1500s and into the 1600s, you had the kind of society that we read about in the Yvain Mitzula, and even if there were social issues and other problems involved in there, there certainly were very, you know, uh, uh, strident uh, st social critics for within the Jewish community of the problems, but they were clearly a very, very impressive culture and civilization It got more and more intensive. Uh, the poster boy for what I'm talking about during the period of uh, the 1640s and all that is the Shach, uh, you know, Shabsi Kohn, who uh, was born a genius and, uh, you know, uh, ends up being, a, you know, marrying somebody very rich in, in Vilna and being a dyan there and writing the Shach on Yoridea, if anybody knows what that is, when he's 18, 19, 20 years old. In other words, you had this cultivation of geniuses uh, running around. 
And uh, these are extremely important works of Jewish law. Uh, this was a golden era of the writing of Jewish law codes because it was a golden era of Jewish autonomy. Uh, the Jews in the kingdom of Poland were given very large autonomous powers by the rulers, uh, as long as it's Jew on Jew. <laughs> And uh, there were a lot of Jew on Jew fights. And what I'm trying to say is that the crown or the local uh, magnates uh, recognized the authorities of the basin. You know, they could overturn it what they felt like it, but usually it wasn't in their interest to do so. And therefore, it's like Spain back in the 12, 1300s. You had a highly developed Jewish autonomous system, which really mirrored uh, the Polish one. If the Poles had courts, the Jews had courts. If the Poles had um, what they call local diets, or let's, we'd say today state legislatures, the Jews developed the exact model of that, what they call the, the Vods. And if the local state legislatures get together in a regional legislature, which they used to do in Poland, then the Jews did the same thing, and there would be the Vod Haaretz. And if the, all the regional legislatures get together in one national legislature as they do, first in Krakow and then in Warsaw, uh, then the Jews will do the same thing, the Vod Arba Arotsos. They're copying it. So who are the people that run these kinds of things? Rich, powerful, learned, you know, a, a highly elitist kind of a society which uh, functioned the same way the Poles did. So it was a period where the rabbinical culture, which that was, that was the middle and high culture, was uh, powerfully flourishing. And you can read the biographies of each and every one of these people. If anybody's interested, just take a look at the art school earlier. I remember one of those books and find what happened to each one when it hits 1648 or 1650 or thereabouts, and then you see a turn in their fortune. For example, the Shach, as I mentioned before, was this big rabbi. He only lived to be 40. Right? He uh, wrote these uh, you know, very seminal works and uh, died very young, relatively speaking. And uh, he's in Vilna. Well, you were with me these last couple of lectures. The fighting was mostly over here, but then it really got out of hand. And eventually, Khmelnytsky calls in the Russians, doesn't he? after the Tartars betray him and hook up with the Turks, because the Tartars are afraid the Russians are getting too strong. If you're confused, that's my point. So the, when the, the Russian army comes in here in 1655, all the way up here, and uh, burned Vilna for 17 days, uh, killed 45,000 people. Uh, you know, it would torture every dude to get their hands on, and anybody could had to flee. So somebody like the Shah, who's a young guy, has to run away, and eventually ends up in another country, in Moravia, which is in the Austrian Empire, and many of the rabbis, the big shots at that time, the Taz, the Shach, and all these other people, either they had to go this way and locate themselves in some part of Poland that was relatively less attacked, and there weren't many places like that, or they fled and had to go to other countries. So there was a whole wave of big rabbi types and other regular Jews who end up going to here, to Austria, places like Vienna and Prague and uh, Mar Moravia and things of this nature, uh, some, like the Vilna Gons, a relative, ends up going like that to Amsterdam. And there we have the beginning of the Ashkenazic Jewish community in Amsterdam. Everybody's familiar with the Sephardic Jewish community there, the Spanish Portuguese one, Menashe ben Israel, Spinoza, if you want, and all those. And they were there first. But on the other hand, they turned out to be a bunch of Polish Jews that come there. Well, what the heck are Polish Jews doing all the way over? And answer him. The answer is, if you're living in the 1640s and 50s, that's an easy question to answer. So it generates its own wave of uh, hard luck stories and what we would call today people having to run away from Holocaust type situations. So obviously it discombobulated the entire uh, Jewish world. Now, uh, internally, this is the fascinating part. Here we are before uh, Tisha B'Av. And uh, the question that uh, people have already asked me correctly so is, you know, how did the Jews react to this internally? And the answer is we're dealing with the 1600s, people a lot more from, I mean, internally. It was an era where uh, skepticism did not reign. Everybody's a believer, uh, with the rarest of exceptions, Jews and Christians. And so uh, that being the case, we have sinned, God is punishing us. That's how you immediately figure it out. What did not happen at that time what happened in the 20th century after the Holocaust when significant Jewish cultural figures who were already alienated from religious tradition, who had undergone a process of secularization, were nevertheless and have nevertheless been trying to cope with the magnitude of the Holocaust, this unbelievably uh, horrible, evil thing, 
which seems to have been focused by somebody at the Jews, but there's nobody out there because they don't believe in God, so what did happen? And once you look for impersonal forces, so it comes hard to find meaning in it, and therefore we struggle with this ever since then. I always call it the Elie Wiesel phenomenon. But uh, there were no Elie Wiesels in the 1600s. That's my point. And so, for example, if you take a look at the book I've been using, which is the classic uh, you know, uh, description of it, the Vain Mitsula, at the very, very end, he's writing this in 1651, I believe, or so. So the war is still going on. If you were here last time, this stuff continued pretty much for 20 years, off and on. Remember, Khmelnytsky brought in the Russians eventually, the, then the, the Swedes came in, uh, then the Tartars renewed the, the fighting, so uh, you didn't have exactly the kinds of dramatic massacres that we described earlier, but you had undramatic massacres. What do you care? Massacre is a massacre. And so he says, Viat hayom hazeh, yeshvim dinas Poland, cherev rov adever goda b'chol Till this time, this is two, three years later, there is a going throughout the kingdom of Poland, Cherev of the sword, and famine, and terrible plagues, in other words, epidemics, and the new misfortunes that we encounter every day make us forget what happened last year, because it's now here. And every day is worse than the preceding day. It's fulfilling what it says in the Tochacha, and the Tochacha, where it says, you'll say, when it's morning, I say, I can't wait till the day's over. And when night is, I can't wait till the next tomorrow in the morning. Notice the present will be, always be unbearable. So he's clearly doing what all the Jews did at that time, which is locating this within the Tochacha. You understand? We Jews, this is Tisha B'Av. In two days from now, it's Tisha B'Av. Tisha B'Av is all about taking the misfortunes, which are historical facts, and locating them within a specific Jewish context. It's the context of the Bible, which is that Moshe Venu says, you're going to do sins, this will happen to you. And so when it, and he describes there all the kind of things that they undertook. And they didn't have a secular attitude to say, well, that's not true. And then they could find some other reason. They said, this is it. And so, <laughs> and he quotes extensively from the Torah that says that, he, that Moshe Venu warns them that even other things that I haven't described in here will befall you. And he said, that certainly happened to us. So he concludes his uh, you know, chronicle by saying, what can we say? How can we justify it? We know we're sinners. You know, what can we complain to God about? If we would make the bold claim that we haven't sinned, uh, 